Welcome, everybody. Excuse me. Welcome and good afternoon. You can see me now. Take your seats. Welcome, everybody, to the official launch event of Culture Moves Europe. This is a new permanent mobility scheme for artists and cultural professionals. Whether you are here with us at La Ballon in Brussels or you're joining us online, I'd like to wish you a very warm welcome. My name is Cory Moore, and I will be guiding you over the next two hours for this live spectacle. It can be called nothing else. If you are joining us online, we, I say live, we are on Zoom, on YouTube, and on Facebook right now. And we will also be, uh, what's the word? We're gonna post this, post it. We're gonna post it online in a couple of days time with English subtitles. But for those of you online, I just want to take a small second to appreciate where we are today. This is La Ballon. It's absolutely beautiful. This is a cultural and creative center for artists and creators. And they run residencies and workshops and bring people together to exchange. And just take a look around. We have this beautiful ancient historical facade. We have the red brick wall, so classic to Brussels. Aren't we lucky to be here today? Yeah? Now, as many of you will know, Culture Moves Europe um, is a continuation of the successful Ipertunus project that took place between 2018 and 2022. It is being implemented by the Goethe Institute and has been fully funded by the European Commission with a whopping 21 million euros. That's the most money ever received for a cultural program. The initiative welcomes artists, cultural operators, and host organizations from all the sectors covered by the culture strand, as well as those countries participating in the Creative Europe program. And it sets particular focus on emerging artists and supporting the mobility of emerging artists. So we have a very impressive lineup of speakers and of panelists. We have two live performances and we have a video. So we've got a jam-packed afternoon together. I'm really looking forward to it. But most excitingly, to kick us off this evening, we have Commissioner Gabrielle joining us tonight, tonight, this afternoon. Um, she's going to kick us off by officially launching this programme. So on that note, I'd like you to give a very, very warm welcome to Maria Gabrielle, Commissioner for, wait for it, Innovation, Research, Culture, Education and Youth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this special moment. Dear Chair of CALT Committee, dear Sabine Verheyen, dear members of the European Parliament, dear Secretary General of the Goethe Institute, dear representatives of cultural and creative sectors, ladies and gentlemen, well, it is a pleasure to welcome you here in the heart of Brussels to celebrate the launch of Culture Moves Europe. Today, I think that we open a new chapter, a new chapter for European artists and cultural professionals. A chapter first that builds on the experience that we already had with the successful e project. A chapter creating new opportunities for cultural mobility. Before we start, let me first thank the Goethe Institute in Brussels for all the preparatory work, hand in hand with the Commission services, which has led to the launch of Culture Moves Europe. I would like to thank you for making this ceremony happen. And I also want to thank Secretary General, who has been a trustworthy partner with extensive experience in the field, implementing this scheme in behalf of the Commission. Our jointly implemented projects, and there have been many so far, Create, Creative Flip, Voices of Culture, Creatives Unite, and Eportunus, to name just a few, have let down a track record of solid results. And I'm convinced that this time will be no different. I would like to seize now the opportunity of this speech to touch upon the rationale behind our support for artistic mobility. Before digging a bit further into the mechanism 
in the Culture Moves Europe grants. First, let me go back to Goethe Institute himself to evoke the reasons behind this dispositive. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe found much inspiration in travel. His journey to the Italian peninsula proved to be, to be defining in his aesthetic and philosophical development. This is a blink of the eye speaking for the values that are the heart of the Goethe Institute's mission. Goethe's journey was itself meaningful because others traveled before him, seeing ancient Greek and Roman architecture, contrasting them, made an impression. Of course, this was the fruit of the cultural mobility of antiquity. In fact, so many artists have found defining growth in travel, from Bruegel's voyage to Italy, to Picasso's move to France, from Da Vinci many trips in Renaissance Europe, to Stefan Zweig's itinerant life through the beginning of the 20th century. Cultural mobility has always been an engine of creativity. And artists have always crossed paths seeking inspiration, new audiences, following masters, and creating communities along the way. This is the very idea behind Creative Europe. Cross-border cooperation in culture is its raison d'etre. It is the DNA of this program. Through continuous exchange, cultural mobility contributes to the growth and preservation of cultural diversity. Indeed, without mobility, there is no diversity, only separate parallel traditions. Enabling artists to cross borders is to connect one's parallel lines, fostering intercultural dialogue. And this is so important, especially these days. We have seen the rhetoric behind the Russian war of aggression in Ukraine. Part of the reason why we do not accept it is because we are aware of Ukraine's identity and cultural significance in Europe. And cultural exchange are instrumental to that end. Ultimately, Culture Moves Europe is another initiative that reinforces European peace and understanding. And we'll leverage it to continue collaborating on projects with our Ukrainian friends, artists and cultural professionals who are part of our Creative Europe family. And to make sure that they can continue their good work even in such difficult circumstances where they may not be able to physically travel, we have even introduced the possibility for artists and cultural professionals in Ukraine to apply for virtual mobility in case they cannot leave their territory. You can see I'm here touching upon the features of the Culture Moves Europe initiatives, which is the second point I wanted to develop quickly. Today, we are launching another step on a long journey. We are building on the experiences and recommendations of the ePortunus pilot project. We all know ePortunus empowered almost 900 artists and cultural professionals to move, to join new communities, and to co-create through that experience. The participants of the ePortunus program paved the way for Culture Moves Europe. Their feedback helped us to shape this new action, and it will shape the experiences of thousands more artists. Well, the budget is ambitious, 21 million euros, but with this budget, why? we are talking about and why this is important, simply because we are scaling up cultural mobility, which should lead to results multiplied almost by 10. 
The scheme will ultimately support around 7,000 cultural mobility projects, which in three years, 6,000 will be individual projects and 1,000 will take place within a residency. And we know that these projects will also allow European creatives to reflect on our great societal challenges via their cultural expression. Iportunus has shown, for example, how artists are reflecting about climate change in their creations. Now, we are 2022, I'm commissioner responsible and for youth too, so the initiative is particularly relevant for young and emerging artists. We know they have the most to gain from these experiences and we have the most to gain by investing in them. Culture Moves Europe holds the power to be a stepping stone in their career, a chance to meet new partners, start new collaborations, and open up to new audiences. I believe that these exchanges will bolster their careers at international level, strengthening the European dimension of their work. One of the distinctive features of the Culture Move Europe is that we try to provide support in the most direct and easy way. Some maybe will smile when they listen that from a representative of the European Commission, but we are showing that is possible. We, fact, we have fixed rates to cover both travel and staying, but these flat rates are combined with four different top-up to make sure that our support is aligned with our values. We have a green top-up for artists who will choose mobility options other than air travel. We have a family top-up because human beings will always be at the center. We have visa top-up to facilitate administration. And most importantly, artists with special needs related to disability will have their costs fully covered. Talking of values natural, naturally leads me to see the intimate and natural links of this action with the new European Bauhaus. The new European Bauhaus is built around three core values that are aesthetism, sustainability and inclusion. So that each community can imagine innovative, local answers to the global challenges they face in their environment. It is in the same spirit that we'll be supporting residences, so artists can work together with local communities to shape their environment. Dear friends, to quote Henry Miller, one's destination is never a place, but a new way of looking at things. And so it is my immense honor and privilege to launch this initiative here with you so that we may find many more perspectives and meeting points. I strongly believe this initiative has the potential to become as meaningful, let's dare, as the Erasmus Plus program, a program that has defined a whole generation. And I cannot wait now to hear more success stories coming from all corners of Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Commissioner Gabriel. I do have one little task for you before you go. You'll see in my hand I have a letter that is directed to the potential beneficiaries of Culture Moves Europe, but it's not quite complete. I was wondering if I could give you this letter, just this one here. If you could open it up and read it aloud and perhaps complete the letter for us. I can read. 
Culture Moves Europe, the new mobility scheme for artists and cultural professionals. This could be an opportunity for you to gear up your skills and your ties with European partners. Thank Fabulous, you. thank you very much. And with that, from this moment, applicants can now apply for a mobility grant. Thank you so much for launching the programme. I would like to invite now Sabina Fahayan to the stage, member of the European Parliament, and also Elka, if she is somewhere here, there you are, Elka. She is Regional Director of Southwest Europe and Delegate for European Affairs in Brussels. And we're going to take a quick photograph. Joining us virtually as well should be Secretary General Johannes Ebert. Johannes Ebert, Mr. Ebert, are you on the screen? Are you coming yes, to us? I'm I should be here. We hear you. How <laughs> mysterious. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very sorry. I had the flight booked and the hotel booked. And on Friday, after two and a half years, I got COVID for the first time. So can we all big, a big, oh. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm really sorry. This is such an important event. So I'm really sorry. We wish you could be here too. But we're just going to take a quick photograph now before we continue with the event. Excellent, and perhaps one more over here, if I could ask you to come. Johannes, we're, Mr. Ebert, we're going to get you into the photograph as well. It's very important. This wow. is a, a hybrid <laughs> event, after all. <laughs> this is the new normal, everybody. Welcome to a brilliant hybrid event. <laughs> Commissioner Gabriel, thank you so much for taking the time to be here tonight. I know you've got a very crazy schedule, so we're going to bid you adieu. So, Vida Fahayan, you can stay with me. I've got some more to do with you now. I wish you goodbye, and you can join me on stage, okay? Thank you very much. It's quite nice to write a letter. We don't do that very often these days, do we? We've written a letter now to kick off this moment, and I've got two more here for you as well, Mr. Ebert, and I'd love to ask you both how you would have completed the sentences. Culture Moves Europe, the new mobility scheme for artists and cultural professionals. This could be an opportunity for you to, I think I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but do you think you can? To experience our wonderful European diversity, but also what is common for us, what is what joined, what was, what is what brings us together, and what we have all uh, equally. That's lovely, isn't that good? <laughs> Herr Ebert, how good are you at improvising? Could you complete the sentence too? Yeah, I would say how to build new European friendships and new European cooperations. Very nice. Because friendships is the personal side, cooperation is the work side. <laughs> we missed that last little bit. Could you repeat that, please? Yeah, the, the, the friendships is the personal side of the exchange, and the cooperation is the working side of the exchange. Great. Thank you. So that's three messages that we have already for potential beneficiaries. But we all are responsible of getting the word out there, right? So I would ask you all now to look under your chairs. Stuck to the bottom of your chairs, you will also find these addressed and stamped envelopes. And I'm going to give you all a minute to complete this yourself so you can send it to other people to let them know about Culture Moves Europe. And don't worry for those of you online. I also have something prepared for you. In the chat right now, you will see a Slido link. And there you can also help us complete the sentence. Culture moves Europe. This could be your opportunity too.
We're starting to get some answers from the virtual community. They're faster at typing than you are at writing, it seems. Having more mobility, have new spaces with freedom of speech, to increase understanding and tolerance, I like that one, to impact climate crisis through art, that's impressive. To learn, to work, to travel, to progress, to continue dreaming, to have, well now my eyesight's really being challenged here. Lots and lots of fantastic answers. Now all of you have this special letter in your hands here in the studio. I would like to ask you to take that home with you. Take that home with you, address it to someone who you know needs to know about this program. It's already stamped. You can throw it into a, into a post box anywhere, but do spread the word because we are now live. Brilliant. Okay, let me check that Herr Ebert is still with us. Herr Ebert, can you hear me? Yes, I Brilliant. can hear you. Now we can have a bit of a chat with uh, Ms. Verheyen as well. I'm going to start with you, Ms. Verheyen. So the European Parliament has strongly supported the increase of the, the Creative Europe budget, and you were very vocal in helping that happen as well. What would you say was the political will of the European Parliament for supporting the cultural sector, but also indirectly in supporting European mobility? For us, it is very important because Europe is the the heart, the soul of uh, culture is the soul of Europe. Uh, if you if you want if you support culture in Europe, you also support the setting up and the building and development of a European Union because a union is more than just a business club. The union is also a cultural unity in the diversity we have. Fantastic! I love that. It's more than a business club. Herr Ebert, the Goethe Institute will be implementing this program, and as we've discussed, 21 million euros is quite an achievement. Do you have anything to add to Ms. Vian's comments about why um, we think that culture is so important to society? I think, firstly, we are very happy that we can impl imp implement this wonderful program. Um, culture is reflecting the societies. Culture is reflecting the discussions in the societies, the debates, inequalities and the actual uh, situation in our societies. And I think it's very important that we cross borders, bring artists, writers, theater makers from all over Europe together to do this reflection on our societies in the European way. And don't forget that artists always have big audiences. So what we start here with, with uh, Culture Move, Moves Europe it will spread all over Europe. And I think this reflects also what Sabine Verheyen said, that this is the, 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 the basic thought of Europe, that it's cross-border and culture can contribute to this very much. Brilliant, thank you very much. You, um, Mr. Ebert, you've also been appointed as the president of the UNIC Global, that's a European network for cultural institutes. So can we talk a little bit about where you see the role of cultural institutes in such a program as Culture Moves Europe? I mean, you see our networks. The Goethe Institute itself has about 40 institutes all over Europe. And with UNIC, which is a, a really master network of all, the, of all these uh, networks, uh, we, we have a very, bit, a very big possibility to spread the news, to address artists, to bring in artists and cultural operators to join the uh, Culture Moves Europe. And uh, I think what is also very good about UNIC that we have big members and small members, so the whole, the whole landscape of European culture is reflected in the UNIC network. And this we will also bring to Culture Move, Moves Europe. And the main thought of it is that we ask the artists what they want in this program. They can say where they want to go, they can say how long they want to stay. And I think this is also one of, one of the basic thoughts of UNIC that the artist the cultural operator is in the center, and this is also reflected by Culture Moves Europe. Yeah, I think it's also important uh, these institutions are a kind of enabler. 
places where artists can meet, where they can set up their own networks, where they can exchange with other artists, uh, because these institutions are connected in the area where they are, where they are seated with uh, all over Europe. And I think uh, also with the unique network, it is a big opportunity, and that's good that we have them as a partner in the program, uh, that uh, the single artist has a place to go to, uh, a contact, a direct contact. He does not has to set everything up by himself, but has a first point to go to, and I think that's yeah, an enabling position that is very important for the success also of the program. Absolutely, it's particularly with regard to emerging artists and people who are starting out in the field and thinking, where do I begin? I think it's a really good, strong network for them to, to be a part of. Exactly. So we heard just now from Commissioner Gabriel about the political context and the key challenges that um, are happening right now with the threat to, nation, uh, to, threat to democracy and um, the rise of nationalism, the war in the Ukraine. What barriers do you see that artists will be faced with and which solutions do you think that we have right now in our hands? I think first it must be easy for artists to travel around because what we had, you, you mentioned that already in the past where the people traveled around, made their experience, uh, it was not good, it was so many artists, it was in the medieval times it was normal to travel also for, for, for craftsmen, uh, uh, things like the uh, or buildings for example like the cathedral in Cologne would not be possible without traveling uh, artists and, and uh, engineers at that time. Uh, that go to other places and bring in their experience, their art, their culture uh, to others. And I think this is important that we enable again that young people can be on the move, can go, have, can be mobile, get new contacts, new ex impressions, to come out of their, let's say, comfort zone to go somewhere else. And uh, for that, we need a, a framework. We need the financial support for them. We need, but we need also the framework uh, uh, of, of having the possibility to, to arrive somewhere, uh, finding a, a, a flat for a special time, making projects for them where they can live for a time in an in a art, uh, artist house or something else. I think that are the things where we have to help, especially young artists, uh, and that is what we can do. But also what is very important for me is that the program must be inclusive, that also people with disabilities, artists with disabilities, for example, in the city where I live, we have a wonderful group of artists uh, that have uh, uh, mental dysfunctions. They are really wonderful artists and people, but they need another kind of support. And also these things must be done via the program because our society is inclusive. Our society uh, should also give these young people a chance. And uh, I think that's important in the program. And that was also something we were fighting for in raising the budget that we have enough m money to support also these things. Yes, it's so important. Many mobility programs do claim to be inclusive and supporting people with different disabilities, but they're not actually putting their money in there. And that's one thing that Commissioner Gabriel did announce. We are going to be providing money for people with extra special needs, so that's fantastic. Um, Mr. Eva, do you have anything to add to that about the barriers during this uh, tricky climate? I mean, uh, what, what is very important that what, what Commissioner Maria Gabriel said uh, that it's not only EU countries, but also neighboring countries like the Western Balkans and also Ukraine. And I think today we are all very shocked by the new attacks, by the new Russian attacks on, on Ukraine. I saw a picture today um, in the center of, of, of Kiev, saw a picture today um, in the center of, of, of Kiev, what, what, what this did. And I think artists, Ukrainian artists, for example, play a very big role in spreading the news about the, these situations. We just opened on Friday a very big program, Goethe Institute in exile in Berlin, where we invited Ukrainian artists who said they also want to put the Ukrainian art in the center and make it more known. And I'm very happy that with um, Culture Moves Europe, we have this opportunity. So I think it's the right program at the right time. And I also want to stress uh, what the commissioner said about the Green Deal, about the, um, the aspects of the mobility program that are connected with the climate change, so that we only want to foster travels which are climate, uh, not neutral, but <laughs> which, are, which, are, which are green. Yeah? We want to uh, put the, 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 the climate protection in the center of this program 
also to get some experience for ourselves. How do we organize cultural events in a sustainable manner? And I think uh, Culture Moves Europe will give us some experiences and some possibilities to, ve to develop also in this respect. Would you like to add something? Um, absolutely. I think with regards to sustainability, we'll deep dive a little bit later on that in the panel discussion because it is a challenge. And as we know, sustainability means so much more than just a flight. It's about sustainable practices and everything that goes with it. So I'm going to come to our last question, but it's a big one. Um, I want to know, I mean, Commissioner Gabriel, you said we want 10 times the impact. This is more money. We're going to make it happen. She's quite optimistic. Um, I'd like to hear from your side, what do you expect for the next three years to come? This is the launch of Culture Moves Europe. This is a huge achievement for everybody here in this room. What can we expect? What can we look forward to? What do you hope for this program? And I'll start with you, Ms. Fahayad. I hope for this program that many, many artists want to take part in this and that they use the opportunity that is given now with this program and that this will lead to a wave of cultural exchange. It should not be just fixed to those who are participants in the program, but these are also ambassadors for European cultural diversity throughout Europe. So also smaller other projects, uh, it, private initiatives can be started following up to these uh, uh, movements to these uh, uh, culture move uh, Europe projects that are that are done or these uh, single exchanges and I think uh, not just numbers are important but also what will be the societal ask outcome of that to really to set up to towards a European identity uh, not a European identity that equalizes everything, but a European identity that respects the differences and the diversity we have inside our societies, but also between the different societies we have in Europe. Very inspiring, isn't it? Thank you. Mr. Ebert, same question to you. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally happy about this program because uh, we worked so long for it with iPortunus and with many ideas that we had before. And I want to thank uh, uh, Sabine Verheyen and the European Parliament and uh, uh, Maria Gabriel, Temis Christofido and their, their teams for making it possible together that we do this uh, program now. We hope, of course, that this will be a reference program for cultural mobility in the U EU. And as we did in iPortunus, we want to collect experiences. So after three years, we, we, we want to know what what worked and what didn't work. But I'm very optimistic that most of it will work, that it will bring people together to new cooperations, and that in three years when we launch the second phase or make a, a final discussion, we will have so many good examples of cross-border European cultural cooperation which reaches out to the European public that we will be very happy about this program. Fantastic. On that note, I'd like to thank you both for taking the time to be here tonight, both virtually and here live. Can you both, can you all give me a big round of applause for our lovely guests? Can you stay here for thank you so much. I'd now like to introduce our first uh, performance, artistic performance of the evening. Dancer and choreographer Radwan Marizigi has prepared a beautiful performance for us. He is a former Ipertunus grantee for the performing arts, and his dancer is Jazir El Yazidi. Sorry, that's the musician. My mistake, it happens. Jazir El Yazidi is a musician, and Younes Hyoho is the dancer. They will be joining us on stage in just a second. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, that was Younes Hojo, accompanied by Yadir El Yazidi, and choreographed once again by Raudan Marizigi. Thank you so much. Wow. Now it's time to relax a little bit and watch a video together. This was created by data collected by On The Move. On The Move is an organization that provides information on cultural mobility that is clear, up to date, and always free to use. The findings in this video are based on information from 1,226 calls published on their website. And while it's just a mere sample of all the mobility opportunities, it reveals some very insightful trends. So, let's take a look. So I have here, if you all direct your attention to the back of the room, hello everyone, I'm over here. I have Marie Foy here from On The Move, the person responsible for all those fantastic facts. Marie, I'd just like to ask you, they say you know, the facts have spoken, but do you have anything to add to give us a bit of context about the video? Thank you very much. Um, just a tiny bit, well, first of all, I want to thank the data collector who has actually been working on all of this. John Ellingsworth was here today as well. Um, and obviously the GOTO and, and the European Commission and European Union to facilitate all of this. But I think what um, was striking to me in those numbers is when you see that out of all those calls, you have only 1.9% supporting access costs, when all this mobility is supported, but only a few people can actually take part of it. And I think with Culture Move Europe, um, with all the top up that are there, it will also make things much more accessible, inclusive, um, and with the, the data being collected and all this information being processed, we can see really where the need is for further support, where such a program can really 
take Europe the step further and um, help us advocate for a fairer and more inclusive mobility um, for all artists and cultural professionals. In a nutshell. Here, here. Thank you very much, Marie Foll. I'm going to run back onto the stage and try not to fall over as I do so. We are now gliding into the next chapter, which is the panel discussion. So I need you, dear audience, to help me welcome a few people onto the stage. First of all, I'd like to introduce Anastasia Lembalovova. She is an artist and founder of Destructura, a multidimensional pan-European initiative that strives to create more opportunities for young people in the art sector. Please come and join me on stage. Next, I'd like to invite up onto the stage Tom Bonte. He is general director of one of Belgium's best-known concert venues, Asien Belgique. Tom. And finally, I have Turan Ziai Mea, which I've practiced so many times, I'll never get it wrong. I'll never get it right, rather. She is a former opportunist grantee and an instigator of the Kiba Project, which produced, um, which focused, sorry, on the conservation of a spiral wooden staircase in Sibili in Georgia. Please come and join me on the stage. And last but not least, we do have a final panelist joining us remotely. This is the spooky part. Vasilis, can you hear us? There we are. This is Vasilis Charalampidis. He is a founding member and president of the board of the First European Creative Hubs Network. Hello, Vasilis. Hello, everyone. Vasilis, if I'm right, you are in Porto, in beautiful Porto right now. Of course. I'm currently in Porto. We have a conference here with more than 200 creatives. So I'm happy to join you from here. We're delighted to have you here as well. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, Anastasia, I'm going to start with you because you're sitting beside me. So, Destructura is also an EU-funded project. It focuses on young artists and funding opportunities for young people. So, maybe we should start by talking a little bit about the kind of challenges that emerging artists and young people are usually facing. We'll be here until Friday, probably, but let's start with a couple of small things. Um, I recently actually, so what we're doing is we have think tanks as part of the project of young emerging artists sitting down together and looking into these problems. This year we had six topics and one of them was professionalization. So how do you become a business when the university tells you that probably you'll be a starving artist until you die? Um, and I talked to a person from this think tank and a certain, a couple of things that she brought up that were also very much linked to mobility are, for example, it's really hard to become a freelancer if you want to do it internationally. She's Polish, she lives in Czech Republic, and she had no idea how to get um, her taxes done, how, what kind of category should she register for, and how to actually call her production. Nobody's helping artists in this domain internationally. So that's one of the things that she brought up that is specifically you know, related to mobility. And another big one is that to actually go somewhere, you have to be um, awaited there. You have to have a project that you're doing somewhere. And you have to potentially go through an open call like we saw in the video or be invited or have some other lucky occasion that you're taking part in. However, a lot of our participants and myself had been applying for open calls for years, not getting in anywhere, not getting any feedback because apparently this is not a practice. And it is in the youth sector, which is very interesting because we live on feedback, but in the culture sector, it's really um, not happening. But once we started having partners who are also young organizations in the art sector, uh, they looked at our art and they were saying, you have mesmerizing works, would you like to show with us? We'll bypass the open call that we have. <laughs> uh, so I think that um, mobility grants are essential. Uh, our participants come from all over Europe, but there are other problems that come with it, and one of them is how do you even get to a stage where you need such a grant? 
Very interesting. Vasilis, I'm going to come to you in that note because I think it's very interesting what Anastasi just said about the need to understand the context and kind of have a workaround. And I know that the Creative Hubs Network, you've been doing this for over a decade. You've seen firsthand these kinds of challenges. And your mobility program um, focused on peer exchanges and kind of matching people. Is that right? Could you give me a bit more context about that? Yes, it's right. So from the very beginning of the network, uh, peer learning is has been one of the pillar priorities of our activities and has proven uh, really essential to all creatives. Um, you know, moving around Europe and being able to exchange views and learn from your peers, is so, so, so essential and people really need it. I mean, um, usually you can have an expert advising or showing you, but usually creative people also don't want to learn from experts or want to be next to peers and people that do the same practice and face the same challenges and solve the problems and address the problems themselves or even identify best practices. But it's true that uh, being a, a community, having access, really easy access to mobility is something really, really essential for creative people. And I think that this is what right now is being addressed with this exciting new program. Brilliant. Tom, you can probably relate to this, right? The Live Europe program is also about setting up this network. You have 21 different venues that are connected through ASEAN Belgique. Do you want to tell us a bit about that and about this, this role of knowledge sharing and this network role? Yeah, well, I have to say I, I completely agree a lot already with a lot of what has been said. Of course, you can have a lot of mobility from artist side, but there is also receiving end. And I think that's where, for instance, Live Europe comes in. It's a network of 21 venues that not only share knowledge on what's happening in your region, eh, because they are locally rooted, so you can, in the talks you have with the other partners, get to know what is happening, what is relevant, in this, uh, in this case, in the uh, popular music field. Um, so, and from there comes uh, the question towards those artists that might be in that region to, to get invited, because that's where the other challenge lies. Uh, it's very hard for artists to invite themselves to a door that is closed. So that's my plea in that sense, to really also take focus on the art, yeah, the, the invitation side. That's where Live Europe comes in, that's where uh, a lot of other networks, platforms come in. So I think those two can go really hand in hand, um, but it's very essential to see them both. Turan, I haven't forgotten about you, I just need to turn a little bit so I can see you. Um, you would consider yourself an emerging artist. You were a former Ipertunist grantee. Well, yeah, I don't know if I would consider myself as an emerging artist. I an mean, I would definitely consider myself yeah, <laughs> as an emerging individual. I would prefer like that. Okay, definition. we can do that, we can do that. Also, I don't know, I, I agree with what has been said. It's very hard to, uh, how can I say, follow your ambitions and somehow like be young, follow your ambitions, be an individual and then also, I mean, uh, live with that and mm. try to sustain yourself with that it's almost impossible it's like it's also like i mean at least for my field in architecture it's very hard to just like decide to i don't know have your own practice like or start for yourself or with other uh, young people as soon as i don't know you 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 want to or as soon as you feel ready to do it there's always like uh, how to can I say, yeah, a procedure that you have to go through and most of the times includes, I don't know, a work that for months or years that is not really paid and that's part of it and it's not, it, I don't know, I, I believe it's not really, how can I say, helping to boost <laughs> your uh, emerging in this sense. But for, I also consider emerging like for myself, like not, I don't know, to uh, emerge in a specific uh, circumstance or but just like to emerge for myself my own ambitions and so it's yeah I definitely agree it's not easy I think that's the most challenging part like to just follow through your ambitions and I want to come back to this um, fuzzy definition of what an emerging artist is as Anastasia I can see that you're you're smiling uh, at the idea do you want to tell us a bit about how you stand on I mean you're you've got a big youth focus with Destructura what is an emerging artist? I don't know. Um, apparently, most of the time, it's somebody under 35, uh, 40 at a pinch, who doesn't have that many exhibitions or projects in their CV, and who is deemed to be full of potential. 
uh, that is the definition that I have collectively come across. Um, I don't particularly like it. Um, the project that we're doing is really very much focused on young people. We have Erasmus Plus, we have um, European Cultural Foundation Support, Alliance, uh, Stiftung, and the questions we get through the open call have to do with age a lot. Um, and I think this is very much related to the definition of emerging. Emerging is very kind of connected to young, and it seems to be a little bit criminal these days to do something for one category of people because you're neglecting all the other people. Uh, I think that you can be an emerging starting out artist at the age of 75, 95, 100, uh, whenever you have the energy and the ambition and the wish to do so. Um, however, if you are doing a project for people that you know best, who are like you, who are young people, and you're saying it outright, my project is to support young people because we know our struggles and we want to do something about them, I feel very much criticized for saying that this is the one person, the one group I'm going to tackle. Um, so for me, um, an emerging artist is somebody who is starting out and who, who is bright-eyed and really ambitious and wants to do things in the art sector, not necessarily young, but there is a group of young people who are very much ambitious and uh, trying their best to make it in the art sector, and that is who we are working with. I don't know if the audience heard that. There was a lovely snort over here from Tom with me on the, on the sofa. Tom, I'd love to Sorry. hear what your response is to this. You did chuckle, not snort, you chuckled. Okay. Okay. Um, no, again, I, I completely agree. I, emerging is, is, is like, uh, um, not so easy to define. Is it upcoming artists? Is it the same? I, I'm not sure. So I completely agree that you can also discover the artist in yourself when you're 70 and you're retired and suddenly you have time and suddenly there you find yourself making something that others consider art. Um, that's fine with me. What I wanted to uh, address also is that I think, um, yeah, uh, it, it's, it's about talent, of course. We define artists having a talent, um, but talent is not the same as ambition, and talent is also not the same as self-confidence. So I think when it comes to having talent, it's very often other people pointing out to you that you are doing something marvelous. Um, and that's really the essence of what art is, and I think that's also where uh, guidance, where structures around artists, uh, are very necessary. It's not only to, to say what is working, what is not working, and to guide them through this, to become emerging, because you could also define emerging as it's other people deciding that you are now emerging, upcoming. It's not you who decides that you're emerging, it's just something that happens to you. So I think this whole context is, is very important to think about what emerging artists can be. I find that really interesting. Vasilis, we had a conversation um, last week about this, and about this idea of intergenerational mixing, and what you were saying, Tom, about somebody pointing out your genius. Somebody from a different generation maybe saying, do you know that you are marvelous? Vasilis, do you have anything to add to that? You, I know you're a big advocate of lifelong learning and trying to bring people together. Can you tell us a bit about how Creative Hubs deals with that? Yes, of course, but first I want to challenge a bit the the conversation here and debate a bit because we don't feel that uh, emerging artists are the people that are starting the practice or doing something as new. It's more about people that are still exper or are just experimenting. And you know, this is part of the lifelong artistic practice. So I think that for us, this is a, a, an important issue to highlight. It's not about starting out. And also, usually, you know, about mobility, because we understand when we have moving and exchanging artists and visiting one another, that we're talking usually of mutual peers. But what happens when you have a young person, for example, want to learn from something like for crafts, for example, and then most probably they would need to kind of communicate and work with an older person. We would love and we love to see this kind of opportunities of exchange. Because um, also heritage, a dynamic heritage, not static heritage, is something really important in the artistic practice. Either if it's music or any kinds of arts or crafts, you need to know from the past generations and you need to interconnect. Networking is not about visiting, it's about exchanging. And exchanging knowledge for artistic practice is something that is like 
what define actually the artists and not something that you start now and you, you need it now and then uh, um, along the way you do not need it anymore. I think you, you need it if you're still an active artist, you need it forever. So I think that these mobility uh, programs uh, and where we're talking about emerging artists, we mean that we want to help artists that are still experimenting and trying new things but don't have the capacity to finance themselves. That's what it's all about. Thank you very much. Uh, Turan, I'm going to come to you and find out a bit more about your Ipertunus project, because you did go out there, you did go somewhere foreign, you did, I guess, experiment quite a bit. Yeah, um, just to give a little introduction. Um, the project was about the conservation of a spiral wooden staircase from the end of the 19th century in Tbilisi, Georgia. And um, it, I mean, for us, it was not just about the conservation of the staircase itself, but also the conservation of uh, the, the social dynamics that were into the, the yard in which then the staircase was um, placed. So um, also, it, th there would be like a lot to talk about, but the conservation was also meant to uh, set uh, a precedent uh, in cultural heritage. Uh, in the city because there's a lot of, uh, let's say, renovation projects uh, that are uh, financed by the, by the municipality and basically they're just um, destroying uh, the old neighborhoods and rebuilding them uh, from scratch, not really considering uh, all the historical layers that have been accumulating, not really considering uh, the people that are, I don't know, living there or uh, the, um, the construction methods, the typical construction methods. So we wanted, uh, I mean, the, the goal of the project was uh, not just to preserve the staircase, to conserve the staircase, but also to uh, open up, uh, let's say, this um, to this uh, discourse. Then, yeah, when um, it was also important, I mean, uh, for us to understand uh, the context uh, while being there, because, um, I mean, one of uh, the team members uh, was, he lived, Thomas lived into uh, the yard for two years, so, um, also, like when uh, he presented to the rest of the team uh, the country and uh, uh, the context itself, of course, we had uh, anticipation. But uh, it's when we arrived there, we understood what was about, and also we, when we started to work into the yard, because we set the workshop into the yard, so all the neighbors could see the whole process and how everything was uh, happening day by day. Um, then, yeah, we, we understood what uh, the, the, the spirit of the yard was about and what was important to save of the city. So it was, uh, yeah, not just then about uh, the staircase and it was about, yeah, a, a whole dimension, an ecology of things and not just the architecture itself. So that was uh, important. So it was really important for you to have somebody on the team who understood the context, who could help you integrate into that yard? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that um, it was about not like uh, somebody that knew the context like generally, but that knew exactly the, the yard because uh, he knew the neighbors. So we had already the trust of the people that were living there somehow. And um, then of course there were a lot of uh, local peoples that, uh, people that helped us during the process. Like a lot of, uh, I mean, more than uh, let's say half of the team then uh, expanded and they were like uh, local people, carpenters or like uh, just volunteers. Uh, it was just like the four of us uh, as the international, four or five internationals, but then the rest was all local people. Um, and um, so, yeah, it was important uh, to have somebody that knew like that the yard and that condition and the people that were living there, because at first, um, I mean, it was, it would have been a bit, uh, let's say, definitely harder if we would arrive there and just, yeah, we will build you a new staircase like that. I don't know, I, I don't believe really in this, in this kind of approach. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that definitely uh, meant a lot, but the, then like we had also, um, like the way the project uh, grew uh, was the thing that for us, uh, um, like it, it taught us a lot because, um, at first, of course, some of uh, the neighbors also have, were a bit skeptical because we dismantled the staircase piece by piece. 
um, uh, very carefully, and then they were like, oh, well, let's see if now you can put it back together. Um, so then, like, when we started, of course, to work into the yard and restore every single piece of wood into the yard, and they were seeing that we were, like, passionate about what we were doing, and uh, then we became part of the family of this yard, and they were, uh, uh, I don't know, making us tea, coffees, helping us, like, to just <laughs> get through uh, the day, because it was also very heavy to let's say, work every day on it. It was a very long process. It, it, it was longer than the mobility itself. We stayed there for one year more. So uh, it was way more than the mobility then. Uh, so that's also another part of the... <laughs> it sounds incredibly exciting, does it not? <laughs> it also sounds inherently like it's a sustainable project, right? I mean, you're, you're refurbishing a staircase, you're not knocking something down and putting something new, but as we have discussed, it, it was very, very difficult to meet sustainability criteria. Yeah, in this uh, regard, I would also like, I don't know, I think the term sustainability needs a bit of uh, redefinition, let's say, because um, I, our working ethics, like, I mean, we, we started the, the, like, how can I say, the, the project because we, and we wanted to maintain as much as possible of the wood uh, that, from which the staircase was built, but because we wanted to keep the historical uh, integrity and the material integrity as much intact as possible. So then, yeah, we ended up reusing as much wood as possible, but it didn't start it with thinking, oh, how to be as more sustainable as possible. Like that was, and this is also what I think that we should think about a bit. It's not that we have to apply, I don't know, a sustainability check on the things. Like things can be thought, and many times the solutions are already like sustainable if we just think a bit more on how the process can be carried out. We also used, for example, natural paint, but we used it because we knew that we had a local business that could provide us with uh, the exact color that uh, we wanted, and it was a local business. Uh, so we didn't have to buy a chemical uh, paint that definitely would have been um, not the same, uh, but at the same time, to make the natural paint, we had to import the oil, uh, the linseed oil, because uh, the oil uh, in Georgia had prices that were just impossible. So also this is like important, like, yeah, you can have a sustainable project, but it depends a lot on what every country has to offer. You can't always be. <laughs> fully sustainable. And this open interpretation, I see Vasilis is nodding enthusiastically and Anastasia has grabbed her microphone. I just want to say, we all saw on the On The Move video that environment and, and sustainability is the most common topic for calls. So maybe it is time to just take a second to think about what does that mean and how can it be defined? And I'll start with you, Anastasia. I was just, um, I, I love the project. It sounds uh, amazing. I actually have something I want to talk to you about later. <laughs> but um, other than that, I think... We really need to make it more realistic and make it more case-by-case -case basis. I don't know, because I've been going to a lot of European youth events. And even when your travel is booked by the organization in some form, um, when the distance is very short, let's say um, Amsterdam to some town in Germany nearby, they're buying you flight tickets instead of buying train tickets. Um, and I, you know, actively had to reach out and say, this is cheaper, uh, this is a couple more hours, this is more sustainable. I don't understand why, first of all, this was not proposed, and the option that was proposed by the organization that propagates sustainability was a, f a very short flight. And I think we need to not miss those little things because they add up, especially when large events for a lot of people are put together, which is more or less my area. Um, sometimes it's impossible, but when it is possible, I don't see a reason not to do it. When it comes to artistic production, I think that was actually one of the very big discussion points in one of our think tanks, that we are, because of a lack of funds sacrificing a lot of sustainability in order to be able to achieve the artistic vision. You would opt for something more sustainable, but you just have nowhere to take the money. You can do a crowdfunding campaign to try 
and say, I want the oil seed paints in Georgia, and then they're gonna say, not my problem. Um, there was a, a whole lot of discussion about how to make this better, and uh, in the report, it's going to be visible. I think it's a step-by-step -step process. I think we are going in the right direction, but I think we need to start being a little bit more sleek about how we, and more honest with each other, because I'm a painter, and as a painter, in order for me to prepare a canvas, the cheapest and the most affordable and the easiest way is to use gelatin. And that is basically mold out bones, which is neither nice nor vegan nor sustainable. And that has been the case for a lot of time for painters. We have alternatives that are a bit more sustainable and they're sometimes vegan, but that is a price I am not able to afford. So starting with the actual put together canvas of a painter, we already have certain issues we can start addressing if we are more aware of them or more honest with ourselves. This is uh, where I think it's interesting that Live Europe has a, a nice solution. Well, no, it's not a solution, but it's a step in the it's right a, direction. It's a suggestion. <laughs> yeah. Wow, I would so much love to be the Messiah telling you the right <laughs> solution. Now, no, um, yeah. Well, uh, very often it comes to money because you're an example there where people propose you to have a flight instead of a train. I think the basic thing why they propose the flight is the flight is cheaper. Um, and we have to address that. And I think, in that sense, the the culture moves Europe idea of giving an incentive to uh, people do this uh, travel in a more sustainable way is a good is a step in the right direction because I think it's purely economically driven, um, unfortunately. Um, to come back to Life Europe, uh, what we just launched last year, so we're still in the developing part of it, uh, is a slow mobility tool, as we call it ourselves. And let's be honest, there is a there is a, a contradiction, let's say, in mobility and sustainability. Those two don't go well together. The moment you start moving, it's already part of the problem. The most sustainable thing to do is stay at home. Um, but of course, that's not what we want. That's not what Europe is built on. So we want to move, we want to meet, and we want to reach out. So then the idea is now, for Life Europe at least, we see very often artists being sent to other parts of Europe for a one one trick, as, as one trick ponies, let's call it like that for a moment. Just like for one thing, one gig, and then they have to go back. What we wanted to think around uh, with Life Europe was to make sure that if they are in that other country invited by that venue, uh, to see if there's other venues in the neighboring, in the neighborhood, in the region, let's say. It's not uh, uh, geographically identified as a nation or anything, but close by where they can do another gig. Uh, so that basically for traveling once to a far, far away country, you can two, you do two or even three gigs at the same time. I'm talking music now, and that's why I say gigs. But um, this already changes a lot because it means that you can reach out to triple the amount of people. The travel among those three mostly cities is done by local transport, it being trains, uh, and the flights don't change. There's still flights involved, but the flight um, earns itself a bit more. What did we say? We said same footprint, more impact. Exactly. Right? That's yeah. kind of... So the slow mobility tool that we now use is not lowering the... Uh, footprint, not at all, but it's at least, uh, yeah, Getting giving more, more buck impact. for your money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. brilliant. Vasilis, I saw you as well nodding about um, this redefinition or this, this looking again at the idea of sustainability. I don't want to exclude you from our conversation. Would you have anything to add? No, everything sounds uh, really exciting from this end. And uh, I want to say that musicians, and they're a great example, I mean, they have been practicing, I mean, sustainability for ages. And uh, this should be pointed out, it's not something radical. I mean, bands have been touring from the 50s and 60s. And to achieve that, because also at the time, flights, for example, was not the best solution. They had to tour and they would have to make a connecting path. But to achieve that, you need the, an active, unified ecosystem. So one thing that we should address is how we could have um, nodes throughout Europe that kind of facilitate all kinds of needs of mobility. And that's why we feel that clubs are the, the best platform, like cultural spaces, concert venues. We should be all connected in order to facilitate those needs. This is really important. Um, with the European 
think it helps network. We have been trying many models of mobility. This year we had like uh, four mobility schemes that used bicycle to move around Europe. I know it sounds extreme, but we had uh, other kinds like fab labs moving with vans. We tried, uh, of course, the train. We have been trying all probable and possible ways. And of course, the qualitative way of handling mobility is really important. Maybe sl slow down sounds a really nice idea. I really like this concept, concept so I would like to follow through this idea. Um, but there are many ways to address this. But the most important bit is that we have to be a united network of artists and we have to find ways to achieve that. Yeah, I can only add to that. It's true that you see very often, at least, I mean, the popular music scene has a lot of impact on, on, on the environment, I have to say, because there's a lot of traveling of artists and in, in pop music there's a lot going on and there's a lot of travel, but it's not coordinated. So you very often see, see tours uh, starting in Lisbon, then going to Scandinavia, then back to Rome, then back to Scandinavia. This kind of, uh, uh, there's a lot of kilometers being done which are very inefficient. And this is all due to, um, yeah, as long as the market pays it, it goes well. Then I'm really talking about the big, uh, the big names in the industry. Um, it's completely a different story for the emerging artists because they hardly can make tours. Uh, so so it, we really have to distinguish, but there is a lot to be gained when it comes to the commercial artists to make really, to adapt their tours to a more ecological model with already, it's still a big footprint, but the foot, footprint can be half with the same gigs in the same countries if you just coordinate it better. Brilliant. I'm going to do one last round before we... We won't close the panel discussion. We'll open up for you all to ask some questions. But I'm going to do one last round where we think about Culture Moves Europe and what recommendations or wishes do we have for this program. I mean, this is the launch. It's very exciting. So I'm going to go, just like in kindergarten, we're going to go round the table and everyone's going to share. And we'll go clockwise. I'll start with you again, Tom. My wishes for? Culture Moves Europe. What should we be doing? Well, I think what what uh, what uh, I think what what the plan is is great. <laughs> um, so I think if this uh, this uh, fund really uh, finds its way to emerging artists, and if we can really make the needs of the artists, emerging artists, meet with the inviting end, and of course I'm here talking from an institution, so I, I'm also pleading for that end. You you never go if you're going on holidays. That's what was my thought. If you go on holidays, you don't need an invitation but if you go for your work somewhere in a foreign country you never go there without an invitation you need somewhere to go to so that's also with funding and, and that's why I think having uh, also a strong network of organizations that are able to invite emerging artists is crucial to make uh, culture moves, moves Europe work but I'm uh, very sure this will happen. Yeah, the host organizations are all part of that too. Thank you so much. Vasilis, you are technically down here for me if you're wondering why I keep staring at the floor. Vasilis, would you like to share <laughs> your wishes for the program? Well, I think it's already been said. Uh, keeping it simple is really important. Keeping, keeping it accessible is really important. And of course, building a network of nodes for us is something that facilitates all the needs that we already discussed. So I think these are the three kind of things that I would say for now. Thank you very much, Turan. Yeah, um, I don't know how to uh, formulate it exactly, but for me it was very important to um, link to the context. Uh, so I don't know I, I what I would wish for the other artists or, I don't know, uh, individuals that are going to uh, access the Culture Moves Europe is to understand where they're going and not just to go and have, I don't know, this kind of uh, elitarian uh, thing happening and then just <laughs> end of the thing. Like, it needs to be something that uh, makes not just you grow, but like it's uh, both ways both ways path so to understand also where are you going and not just do because you have to <laughs> thank you the harshest for last yeah. <laughs> let's do it um that's not really harsh it's just very practical things that uh, all project managers or artists have to deal with when applying for grants 
the application form itself needs to be clear, accessible, well put together, and there needs to be somebody who can help you understand what's happening there, which is not always the case. All of our successful applications have been with the help of some consultants, consultants who basically tell us this is what is meant by this question. And from our end, it's like, oh, that's a surprise. Um, so this is one wish to make it truly accessible. Um, second is, as I mentioned beforehand, feedback for unsuccessful applicants if they request it. Because in my experience, a lot of very talented artists and participants of many projects I've been part of um, have the ideas, have the potential, have the will, have no idea how to write an application. They don't know how to put together a budget. They don't really understand the required language and the goals of certain application forms. Uh, so just simply giving them a little push and making sure that they understand what is required with some feedback, if they are unsuccessful, would open the door for a lot of great projects and a lot of people who feel better about themselves, not like they're unable to do anything, just that they didn't get it the first time. Um, yeah, and I wish for 7,000 people or 7,000 projects that are to be supported by Culture Moves Europe to I'll get a lot of attention and be seen and be enjoyed by people. And I wish to go to all the 7,000, but I will see about that. <laughs> Just like this wave that Sabina Fahayan mentioned before, the 7,000 project shall trickle and move and move things. Thank you all so much. That's enough questions from me. That doesn't mean you're off the hook. You're going to stay here on stage. Vasilis, you're going to hang around as well a little bit. We're going to open up the Q&A. We're going to open up to the audience here live. I'm going to stand up in a couple of minutes when I get the energy to do so, and I'll come and give you the opportunity to ask some questions to our panel. Also, for you guys online, you can also ask your questions using the link in the chat, and I should have them appear magically into my hands. So we'll have a look and give it a couple of minutes for people to write down their questions. Is there anybody here in the audience who is burning to ask one of our panelists something? They're still thinking about it. We're going to give it a few minutes. Oh, I've got lots of nice questions coming up here. So Tom, the first one's for you. Bring it on. How do you manage at all to attract an audience when you present emerging artists that are not necessarily known internationally from other European countries? Um, it depends from, I mean, maybe that's something important to tell you. I mean, I've been working in the performing arts for 20 years, so I've mainly worked in theatre and dance, and since two years I'm working in music, which is a completely different, different field. Piece, yeah. um, with a different logic I learned the last two years. Um, this said, I think, um, uh, well, I have a career built on emerging artists. I only presented basically emerging artists. You build it by people start um, trusting your institution as an institution that makes a good selection of talented people. So even if they don't know the artist, they come because they trust, yeah, the institution, or I don't like the word institution that much, but the organization that is behind it to make clear um, decisions. Of course, you can debate over all, all, all these kind of decisions, but you know what kind of work you will get if you go to that uh, institution or organization, which is a first way of dealing it. So it's persistence. Uh, believing in emerging artists is, is really a persistent job from the side of the artist as well as on the side of the organizer, I have to say. Um, and building audience comes from there. So it can really start very slowly and it builds up in the music. There's another way of doing it. It's um, and I'm, I don't even. It, it's uh, I don't know the word in English. I have to say it's it's programma. It's basically you have the big name on, and there's a whole system the of the support act. Exactly, that's what I was looking for, which in music is very very common and it works very well because it's a very simple idea. There's 2,000 people coming from your, for your main act. You put very often a local act uh, before that, or it's a local, or it's an act that the, the, the known band invites along because they really strongly believe in it. It's a, it's a kind of logic which is also interesting for other forms of art because a lot of artists know other artists that are unknown that they strongly believe in, 
Um, in music, it's very common. You take them on tour. That's what you do. You just bring them along and you show them to that audience. Um, so there's something to learn there. Um, but of course, it's, uh, there is also a different dynamic. Uh, popular music, as the word says, has popular in it. So there is a very low uh, stepping in. Uh, it's much different with theater and dance, where there is more of an ambient of uh, intellectualization. Uh, so for a lot of people, it's very much more difficult to step in. Music is everywhere in our life. Theater and dance tends to be a bit more on a distance for a lot of people. So that's also a reality. So the question is double, depending on what kind of artist you are uh, referring to. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, I'm really pleased we did get some questions. So the next question here is addressed to both of you two. It says to Anastasia and Turan, with the struggles and difficulties young artists and culture professionals are facing, how do you manage to keep going in the artistic sector? It's a bit grim but we might get some good coping strategies. I mean, what keeps you burning? What keeps you moving forward? Um, you basically do other things. <laughs> um, for now, that is the case. I, I come from a background of 10 years in the European Youth Parliament. Very early on, as a painting student, I realized that with everything I was being told and shown, I will never have any idea how to sell anything, so I have to start doing internships and in galleries. Um, so not only was I spending a lot of time painting three weeks uh, in a row, not leaving the studio for evaluation days, I was also traveling a lot for European Youth Parliament sessions and I was doing internships in galleries across Europe so that I could understand how it all works and what sells and how, how, how does it you know, come about that you can make a living as an artist because this is not something taught at art school, which is also something we need to fix. I think that right now my model is um, Unfortunately, very little sleep, having an organization that needs to run, that um, is responsible for a lot of people, and it has gained a new dimension since the 24th of February, because, uh, for example, one of my core team members and a very good friend of mine is currently in Kiev, and this morning she was sending me messages saying, I'm not sure whether I should go to a bomb shelter or stay in the bathroom. Um, and she was staying a lot with us in Estonia, and the organization that supports emerging artists, she's an architect and uh, a culture manager. Now we're looking for ways to have her come over and uh, at least for a while be safe because we have an arts organization that can achieve that, that also needs funds. And now I finally have a painting studio where I, can, where, where I am right now. Um, so I am going to be combining this sort of work with my artistic work, which I am not willing to give up. Um, armed with a little bit more knowledge about how to actually sell something once I have a painting. So you're equipping yourself with the tools that you need to kind of overcome these barriers and you're just, you're fighting forward. On the one hand, it's equipping yourself with something that works in the structure that you're in. And on the other hand, if you're a bit more bold, it's also uh, tackling the structure and saying, hey, here's a problem here, problem there, problem here, and maybe we can fix that so that people after me don't have to Start not from sleep scratch. for weeks. Yeah, exactly. Thank you very much, Turan. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I also like. I think for architecture is uh, maybe a little bit different than from like I don't know being a painter or an artist in this sense. But um, I think that we should a bit start to think less in compartments. Also, like um, architecture needs to be just architecture, and that's that's it. Like. To survive, sometimes you need maybe also to include other uh, sectors, like to, to make, yeah, I, I don't like to, to call it network, but to make a network that is not just uh, about architecture, so that then you can make it possible to, in the future, do just architecture. So like to start with something that maybe includes also, I don't know, other crafts, and also like, I don't know, in depending on the territory, of course, depending on the on the geographic area, that's also very important. But uh, depending on that, also to uh, find I don't know uh, small uh, local uh, businesses that can 
help you in I don't know starting to develop like your 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 projects and like unite you can then like uh, maybe achieve your goal and to then one day be uh, independent and be an architect uh, but yeah that's also like not easy it's not that I, I'm just also talking about something ideal because I, I I didn't start to do that but ideally yes I would I would do it like that then I don't know <laughs> but well yeah, good luck <laughs> Thank you so much. I have, have another question here that's to all the panelists, but Vasilis, I'm going to start with you. Um, this is from, uh, we've established that I can't pronounce names already, right? Uh, this is Rasa Bokoche on Zoom. Hi, Rasa, I'm sorry. Um, you talked a lot about artists who are already keen to move around Europe and to collaborate. How do you think this program could benefit and motivate artists, especially cultural professionals, who are usually not moving around in their professional practices? Okay, so Vasilis, it's really about how do we get people excited about mobility who aren't usually mobile? Vasilis, have you frozen? Are you there? How about we start with somebody else? Tom, would you like to answer that question first? How, what, I mean, the music industry is inherently touring and things, but you've got this background in performing arts. So tell me. Jump back a bit to, to is it not working? Well, OK, I'll, I'll try this one. Um, yeah, I find it a very interesting question because not all artists are self-confident enough to go abroad or have the ambition to go abroad or are even not interested. It's only a partial answer, but I think there again, it's making right connections might convince... First of all, I don't think that artists necessarily should travel. It's a bit contradictory to the Culture Moves Europe if they don't want to and their, their work is interesting and they, they benefit from staying at home, uh, being a, a couch traveler, that's fine as well. But if there is a spark, and then I think it comes to uh, culture um, organizers, uh, institutions organizers, to make uh, interesting meetings. There's basically an artist to put him together with somebody in another country who has a practice that is very similar or that is completely uh, adding up to what uh, the emerging artist that you're talking about is already doing. This makes for interesting connections and might be relevant for that artist to indeed understand why going out abroad is, uh, is, is in benefit for him or her. Thank you very much, Vasilis. I think you're back with us. Did you hear the question? Or well, shall I'm I repeat here. it for you? Um, I partially hear the question, so I couldn't listen very well because of technology, but um, I'm here again. So basically, we just want to know, for people who are usually not very active and, and moving around in their practices, what can, what kind of messages can we give them to encourage them to try it out, to be brave, to, to, to experiment maybe with mobility? What are the arguments for mobility for cultural professionals? Okay. Yeah, so I think it's been said already, not all artists need to travel, and that's not like a one-way thing. Uh, of course, introversy is also part of uh, some kind of artistic expression. But I think that it's really important that people connect with relevant communities and identify themselves within them. So I think that everyone should try and see what their peers are doing, get inspired. Inspiration is really, really important also in the creative practice. So um, I think this is the motivation for people, like uh, learning new ways of doing things, learning of new things, exchanging views are important things. And as of the way to connect, uh, I already said that the, the nodes are really important. So not only the remote nodes, but the local communities and the local nodes. So for example, creative people could hook up with the local hub that can provide them the information and the way to connect. So your local community can be also that pillar that will connect you with the global community. And that's really important. So I think that's a, a, a good way to start. Brilliant, thank you. Tulan, do you, do you connect with that from your experience in Sibili? Um, well, um, I don't know. I, I, in my case, um, at least, I think that uh, also all of the members of the team, like we always uh, were, I mean, we, we traveled uh, a lot, but um, 
yeah, uh, it, it, it's also like, I don't know, for when you are dealing with the cultural heritage of another country, of course, you need like to understand exactly what uh, you, you need to do. You need to understand the context and the people that like you need a lot of, uh, let's say, um, um, yeah, welcoming in this sense, like you need uh, a basis, a strong basis to work on in this sense. But yeah, I don't know. I think that also, I mean, uh, I know a lot of like extremely like talented artists and um, in, in Georgia, for example, that I don't know, uh, they didn't really like travel uh, and uh, to, to be that talented, but they are like, extremely uh, like it, it's amazing to see their works anyways so it depends on I don't know on whatever individual is looking for I think it's not something that must happen it can happen also without I agree on Tom's <laughs> point of view um, I think it has to do more with understanding the reason why they're not traveling if it's a choice if it's not in any way a wish or a need, then if there is nothing that needs to be done there, this is their preference, this is their job, this is their work. However, if we're talking about people who, as Tom mentioned, are feeling afraid or not like they're ever going to receive a grant or like it's not their place to get all of these elitist or difficult things, I think in the case of people who are not confident enough to try, it is important, the communication is important, the message itself is important to show that we believe in people in all different sectors and the application is simple and you should definitely give it a go if you're at all interested. We wanna see all sorts of art. Um, an issue I have come across a lot in the art sector now is that it's actually pretty funny because on the one hand, it's people being very ferocious and warrior-like when it comes to not being paid for certain things they're doing, like why are you stealing our intellectual property and why are you making me do this and uh, not giving me anything? Um, if not knowing the teams behind the scenes are not really paid well or at all. Um, and this is on the one hand, they wanna fight for the right to get paid, and then when it comes to actually funding a project, they're like, we have no idea how to do it. How do you, you know, you, you have some money, how did you get the money? I don't know how to get money. <laughs> um, so there is this disparity of, um, we don't have the knowledge, we don't feel like we're ever gonna get the funding, we don't feel like we're ever going to be good enough to receive it on the one hand, and on the other hand, we don't want to work for free, which makes sense to me, because the art sector is extremely exploitative, especially of young people, in all different ways I can tell you about later over a cocktail or something. Nice keyword, cocktail. On that note, I just want to thank all of the panelists heartily thank you so much for contributing to our session today it was really really brilliant before you leave the stage we've got a couple of things to say to them so just stay seated right for you all at home if you do have very specific questions with regards to the application process or your el eligibility or specific questions around culture moves europe there will be two open question sessions and they are on the 14th of october from 10 to 11 and on the 21st of october between 2 and 3 but there'll be more information about that online as well so with that i will thank you once more and i will introduce our final performance of the evening and then we'll get off stage this is orlean odo again apologies orlean um, he is a circus artist and he has his own company called back pocket so everyone please give orlean a huge round of applause and we'll skip off stage <laughs>
Yes. Incredible. That was Orion Udo. Wow. I don't know if you caught that on the live stream, but there were lots of <laughs> gasps in the audience here today. We are slowly coming to a close of our wonderful program. It's been so much fun having you here, but we do have some lovely closing remarks now planned from Temis Christofidou, who will share the closing remarks as Director General for Education, Youth, Sport and Culture. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. This was magical. I'm still uh, not, uh, I haven't recovered yet. Wow. Uh, I tried to be uh, very carefully and dutifully uh, listening to, to the requests from the panelists. Um, first, I want to thank Tom because he basically said it's good as they've designed it. Thank you, nobody ever says these things. But, uh, people always complain, so I found somebody who says it's good as it is. Uh, thanks a lot for that, you made my day. Now I heard, keep it simple, uh, give feedback, Applications, uh, application form simple, and all this. I'm glad we have here uh, still the honorable member of the European Parliament because I can blame her, first of all. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, the, I can blame the, the audit and budget committees. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that if, if, we, uh, if they uh, would let us just give a check without asking for anything, you know, we'd be happy to do this. It would be simpler for you and for us. But we have to give, you know, some, some amount of accountability. So we, we have auditors, we have uh, uh, the, the parliament committees, we have uh, ministers of finance. So it's a permanent balance between simplifying, and we try every, every day to simplify uh, the, uh, the procedures, and keep this accountability for the taxpayers' money. So it's a balancing act. It's... Uh, Quite tricky, not as difficult as what we watched, but close. Um, so we, we, ha we have to live with that. Another tricky thing is that um, we all here agree totally that uh, funding is important, that we always need more money for artists, that artists are underpaid, over, often not paid, and uh, uh, we, we all agree. Ministers of culture all agree most of the time. Uh, problem is, every seven years that at the EU level the budget is discussed, it's the ministers of finance that decide where the money goes. And the ministers of finance always believe, uh, we believe wrongly, but they uh, have a different view, that whatever is, makes economic sense is to be financed. Uh, so there's, there's a permanent argument to make that, yes, art and culture and uh, creativity uh, is about a lot of things, but also has, makes economic sense. And it's also uh, the industries, uh, the cultural and creative industries are a significant part of the European economy because that's the only language they understand. So another, one of these tricky acts. But we, we really seriously try to every time listen to your concerns and try to, to do better so that we simplify things so that more and more artists can, um, uh, can um, access the funding. And on this accessibility, I would also have one little um, request. Those of you and online that have done a project, maybe there is also a chance to give something back by helping somebody else fill in a form uh, so that uh, somebody you know, will come after you and get the, their project funded. Because yeah, it's not always easy, but this giving uh, something little back uh, can be nice, and after all, is not a lot to ask. Dear Chair of the Cult Committee of the European Parliament, uh, dear members of the European Parliament, uh, dear Secretary General of the Goethe Institute, uh, dear Johannes, uh, I don't know if he's still online, dear representatives of the, of the cultural and creative sectors, uh, this launch ceremony is coming to an end. It has been uh, a great two hours for me and I'm sure for all of you. 
and uh, it has been a great pleasure and we don't often have the chance during office hours to, to spend uh, some time uh, in such an, an inspiring way. So I'm grateful for that. I would like to start by thanking the artists who performed for us today. Thank you very much for bringing us together around the beauty of your craft and it was really magical. Indeed, this is what culture, art, heritage and beauty do. Nespa. They touch our souls, they bridge our differences. Art has the power to speak to each and every one of us in a different way. Yet, in that moment when music is playing, when we are dancing, when we're watching a play, when we're absorbing the beauty of a piece of art, we suddenly all feel connected. This is what makes any community, this feeling connected. And so, to empower artists to move across the EU, to help them share the beauty of their art with their neighbors, even the far away ones, is the ambition of this European project. This is what Culture Moves Europe will do. It will lead to new and reaching co-creations with partners from other countries. It will change the course of many careers, launching artists in new interesting directions. It will contribute to the resilience of the cultural and creative sectors, and it will bring us all together. I'm convinced that Culture Moves Europe will be a success story like iPortunus has been, like it has been the case for, for mobility under Erasmus. You know, the, the thing that uh, almost every time I meet somebody who has done an Erasmus project, I hear is, it has changed my life. So I believe that this, uh, the, this program will have the same power because not only mobility responds directly to the needs of artists and cultural professionals, but also because we worked hard to make the scheme more user-friendly. <coughs> and we learned a lot from its predecessor, Iportimus, which is already a success, even if it has been a small test. I want to thank our speakers, the panelists, for these precious contributions, your active and insightful participation in this debate and reach the reflection on our initiatives towards young and emerging creators, and maybe not so young also. I would also like to thank wholeheartedly the Goethe Institute in Brussels, the director, Elke, and her team for the professional organization of this launch event, as well as my own team in the European Commission who together with all the partners from the Goethe Institute have put so much work, commitment, uh, passion uh, to organize this event. Now, all that is left is for our amazing artists to apply, to be inspired, to grow, innovate, nurture their experiences and cherish their partnerships. We're very excited to start this new experience together with you. We're looking forward to your, applica forward to your applications. Thank you. Thank you very, very, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we are coming to a close. I can only add my thanks to all of you for being here this afternoon, for all of the people who contributed today, to the European Commission, of course, and to the Goethe Institute. But there's a couple of other key players who helped make today happen that I'd love to mention as well. So you can start clapping now. Let's say thank you to La Ballonne for having us today. <laughs> to La Régie, who took care of all the live streaming. To Navid Fayaz, the photographer. Blanche, the DJ. She's at the back. And shortly, we'll thank them already, but Bellissieux are providing the catering, and I think we're all going to be very happy about that as well. So we'll give them a round of applause. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining us online as well. Have a lovely evening, and please take care. <laughs>